Welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast, helping people take their leadership to the next level. Brought to you by Blackby Ministries International. Well, welcome back to the second episode of the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. Uh, my name is Sam Camp, and I'll be your host as always. Uh, Richard, it's good to be back with you here in your library. Oh, uh, it's always good to be with you. Yes, it's uh, you know it's always inspiring to come down and peruse the the bookshelves. I tell you, just it's my little sanctuary here to be <laughs> surrounded by all my books, all my boring biographies that my children tease me about. <laughs> Well, you you mentioned last uh, episode about a 10K that you'd set a goal this year. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to remind you of, <laughs> of that goal. And uh, as, as we as we all we're, well, as we all strive to be better in, in, in different areas. Well, thanks. You know, and it is it is good. And I, I hope that everybody has got at least one stretch goal, as they call it. You know, you have to make your goals kind of reasonable. But, but I think you want to also measure yourself in some way to say, Am I gaining ground anywhere? And so, yeah, for me, I'm I, right now. I need to just consistently be able to run a 5K. Uh, I would love to get to 10. And you know, if you get to 10, then you start thinking, well, how much farther to make it to like a half marathon? And yeah, it's I don't, you know, it's it's really. Uh, and you've done marathons, so you, I have, you know what it's like. I I do. It's painful the the full <laughs> <laughs> the full marathon. But I'm of the mind that most people, if if they're committed, if they set their mind to it. They could at least do a half marathon. I think most people, most individuals, because uh, because once you you know once you do that 10k and then you stretch a little bit further, a little bit further, adding on a few more miles to that, yeah, it's not quite as hard as those initial. It must be miles. like I know that if you kind of get through that initial sort of pain, I I it usually hits me about the two mile mark. It's like, do I just want to? walk the rest of the way and <laughs> yeah I, I know that just some it's I, they always say it's it's more mental toughness i think than physical toughness sometimes it certainly it certainly is and uh it can be a challenge for sure but but it, <laughs> it is, it is possible it is possible for sure well i'm and, working at it and and i look forward to the day when, <laughs> when we sit down and, and you have accomplished that and you will hear about it when i oh do. <laughs> I, I, well maybe i'm not looking forward to that day so much <laughs> Well, let's uh, get into this leadership stuff. Um, I'll say straight off the bat here, uh, you and your dad, Henry, uh, have written a book entitled Spiritual Leadership, mm -hmm. and uh, it has been widely read. I've read it myself. I think it's, you know, if I'm being honest, one of the, the best books that I've read on leadership, and it's been used, I know it's been used in, in various colleges, uh, universities, as a textbook for leadership. Yeah. This is a leadership podcast, so we should talk about your definitions of leadership. And, yeah. and there are quite a few definitions out there. There's are hundreds. There not? Yeah, there's hundreds of definitions. And, and I've made a practice of reading leadership books. And so one of the first things I always do is I kind of have on my radar, well, wh how do they define leadership? And that, of course, is going right. to set the tone for the whole book. Now, not, not every book will define it. Uh, some, some books kind of just assume you know what it is. But oftentimes, early on, they'll, they'll set that out and describe what, what they think leadership is. And so we, we did that. And that was a, kind of an agonizing venture for me and my dad because my dad kept wanting to add more and more to the definition and say, well, right. it's this too and it's that. And I would say, but, it's, but that's implied in this definition. Let's get a definition that is as succinct as possible where every word matters. And I still feel pretty good about it. We wrote this book initially in 2001, and I still don't think I would change the definition. So let's just get the definition out of the way then. Well, okay. what, what is you the, asked. <laughs> <laughs> what is your definition? Well, we're defining what we call spiritual leadership. And we say spiritual leadership is moving people onto God's agenda. And we think every one of those words are crucial. You make the distinction, and even even the title of your book is spiritual leadership, yeah, as opposed to just plain old regular leadership. Why do you make that distinction? Well, you know, and there and many people I'm sure are familiar with Oswald Saunders, who wrote a book back in the '60s called Spiritual Leadership, and I 
I always felt like it was maybe the best book on leadership I'd read, at least until I wrote my own. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But we love the title, we love the focus, and so we ended up taking the same primary title and calling it spiritual leadership. And and the reason is because in one sense, leaders, you, there, there's some fundamentals of leadership that apply whether you're an atheist or you're a Christian. It's in, it involves working with people, right. and so. You know, any kind of leader, no matter what your religion is, you're going to do certain things. Uh, and, and that comes kind of in the later part of the definition. But spiritual leadership is unique. It's a unique kind of leadership because of the word spiritual. And spiritual implies the Holy Spirit. It, it implies the fact that you don't just lead on your own. It's not just uh, you and your innate abilities or learned abilities. Uh, those are all important, but Christian leaders have something that atheist leaders don't have, and that is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What, what we've discovered is that many Christian leaders act as if the presence of the Holy Spirit doesn't make any difference. I mean, if you, you could take a lot of pastors even, you could take a lot of Christian leaders and watch how they lead and say an atheist would have led exactly the same way. They would have worried about the same details. They would have thought that how much money they had was the primary factor in what they did. Uh, they would make all the same decisions in the same way that an atheist would make decisions. And, and so just because you're a Christian does not mean you're a spiritual leader. A spiritual leader is someone that leads in the spirit. And by that, I mean they interact with the Holy Spirit's presence in their life. So for instance, um, if you're a spiritual leader and you uh, get uh, upset about a staff person and what they're doing and you blow up at them, hopefully you don't, but if you were to do that, you go back to your office and the Spirit of God goes with you and he begins to convict you to say, boy, that, bo that, that employee may have messed up, but they certainly didn't deserve to be demeaned the way you just did, to be publicly right. humiliated. And you, you are supposed to be representing me. That's a human being with self-worth and you've just degraded them and you need to go back and apologize. Or there have been times where I've sat in my office with lots of work to do and the Spirit of God impressed me with a particular staff person and I just felt as if the Spirit of God was telling me I should go check on that person. And, and I remember at times even battling that and saying, well, but Lord, I've got so much to do. I've got a call coming soon. I've got uh, this paperwork I've got to read through. I've got these documents to sign. I've got this talk to prepare. But there have been times where I just really felt like the Spirit of God just said, this is more important right now. And I've, when I've been responsive, I've gotten up and gone to talk to someone and Lo and behold, they had a horrible weekend, and they're almost in tears sitting at their desk. And all of a sudden, the boss uh, shows up and says, hey, I just really had you on my heart and mind this morning. Just want to see how you're doing. And the look on their face tells you everything, that the Spirit of God mm -hmm. just guided you to be used by Him to make a difference in someone's life. Well, well, an atheist doesn't get guided by the Spirit. An atheist might have a conscience, but they're not they're going to be convicted the same way by the Spirit. Maybe the last thing I just say about that is the Spirit of God also knows something I don't know, and that is He knows the future. And He also knows what's in the heart and mind of people. So when I'm trying to make a decision, you know, the future, I'm just guessing. I, I don't know. But if I'm trying to make a, a decision, I could go to the left, I could go to the right, I'm not sure which one to, to go. Well, the Spirit of God knows already what, how things are going to turn out. He knows which way is better. And so if I'm walking in the Spirit, He can guide me to make wise choices that are, you know, people will, will ask later, well, how did you know to do it this way instead of that way? How did you know it was going to work out like that? I have to say, well, I didn't know that, but I, I was talking regularly to someone who did know. Same with hiring. You know, people can always look good on a resume. They can always come up with a pretty good interview. They can tell you all the things they think you want to hear, but the Spirit of God knows what's in their heart. And I've had yeah. some checks in my spirit where the Spirit of God just clearly said, this person looks too good to be true, and sure enough, they are. So don't you know, st steer away from this person. And uh, so there's just so many things, and we'll, we'll unpack a lot more of those very practical ways the Spirit makes a difference. But to say a spiritual leader, they will do a lot of the same things that 
secular leaders will do, but they have an advantage. And there's a dimension to their leadership that's different, that's uh, of a higher level, because they're functioning in tandem with the Holy Spirit. There's a couple of other aspects about your definition that I just want to point out and get your feedback on. And for example, you you use the term moving. Yeah. Um, I've heard, you know, in other definitions of leadership that, you know, influence is, is thrown around a lot. Mm-hmm. Why, yeah. why did you why did you go with moving? Well, uh, I mentioned Oswald Saunders in his book, Spiritual Leadership, and he actually says leadership is influence. A lot of people may not be familiar with Saunders, but they may more likely be familiar with uh, John Maxwell, who mm-hmm. just takes that same definition and sa- and popularized it today and said leadership is influence, plain and simple. I guess I could be okay with that, but I just I don't really necessarily like that uh, definition because. You know, influence by itself is a little bit nebulous. You know, you, you, yeah. influence can mean anything. I mean, you can be a bad influence. You can, you know, you can walk by a classroom and throw a stink bomb into the into the room, and you can be an influence. You're a disruptive, negative influence. You're, but uh, you've inf- you, you've had an influence. You know, and so I know people that are very disruptive people. They talk all the time. They're attention seeking they always are grabbing the microphone they're always always have something to say people are rolling their eyes they don't want to hear this guy he's an egomaniac he just loves to hear himself talk but he thinks he's being a leader because he's having an influence and i'd say that's not leadership i chose the word moving that you move people now you can be a negative leader as well you know adolf hitler move people to be anti-Semitic and to kill people and to sure. invade other countries. But he, he was a leader, there's no doubt about it, and he he moved people from where they were to where he wanted them to be. And that's really what leadership is. It's When a leader does their job, people aren't in the same place they were before. So if you're, if you're leading preschoolers, you're going to take those preschoolers from being selfish, rude, thoughtless, lazy preschoolers who think that life is just about playing all day. And over time, you're going to lead them, move them into responsible adults that are thoughtful of others, that know how to work and get their job done and be polite. If they're still selfish, lazy people who just want to play all the time when they're 25, uh, you, you have not led. Years later, they're still in the very same place they were. They're just older. And now they have to shave. But they... Uh, but 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 fundamentally, they're in the same place. So I always realize that the job of a leader is to take people from wherever they get them and move them to where they ought to be. And so I, I hear people sometimes who will say, uh, you know, I, I'm a pastor and I've been working hard. I'm preaching every week and uh, I'm I'm ministering to, to folks and so on. And I'm I've been leading. And yet you look and you say, but the church is still in a disaster. I mean, you don't have any more people. You don't have any more programming. Uh, there's still a lack of morale. You're, you're showing up. You're, you're doing busy work. You're having meetings. But the people are in the same place they've always been. Uh, you haven't really led. You've just conducted some meetings. You've just preached some sermons. But to lead means that people aren't where they were when you found them. And, and by the way, that's also on a positive side. When a leader is comes to a new job and finds people are, are in a disastrous place, the leader doesn't necessarily get all discouraged about that because they know that they're not going to stay in that place. Yeah. And so I, every, every job I've ever had in leadership, the people that I inherited were not in a place that they should be. And so I didn't lambast them for that. I didn't say, I can't, I can't lead here. These people are all in a terrible place. I'd say, well, that's why they've asked me to lead so that I can take them from where they are and move them over time to where they ought to be. So uh, I love the, 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 the word move because it, it implies a change. It, it, it implies progress, that you're moving toward a destination, a goal. Uh, you may not have arrived there yet, but you've, you're not where you used to be. And so I like that because you can measure that too. Yeah. You know, you don't, some, some people think they're leading just because they work hard, you know, or they're doing the best they can. And I would say, well, that, how do you measure that? You, you've worked hard all week. So does that mean you're a good leader? Well, no, like the way I measure your leadership is not by how hard you work, 
by what, by what the results are. After a week of your leadership, are people in the exact same place they were before? And if they are, you, you've just been working hard all week, but you haven't been leading. Hmm. Leading implies movement. Richard and his father, Henry, wrote a book called Spiritual Leadership. This book has been used in university leadership courses, and it's a great resource for anyone who wants to take their leadership to the next level. And right now, you can get 10% off with promo code PODCAST. Go to blackabystore.org and use promo code PODCAST at checkout for 10% off your copy of Spiritual Leadership. And we'll also have links to the book in the show notes. We're always talking about people and you're always saying that we're moving people onto God's agenda. Yeah. Why people and not, you know, moving your organization or team? Or yeah. Well, why, you why know, people? and we'll, and of course, each of these words in this definition we'll come back to uh, often in these podcasts, but there's a couple of important reasons. One is leaders forget to their peril that they lead people, not organizations. Mm. I know leaders who have come into organizations and they're working away on their mission statement, they're working on their brand, their logo, uh, they're working on uh, maybe the, the facility or the marketing campaign or whatever else, but they forget that they work with people. And when you forget you work with people, you start using people and abusing people and taking them for granted. And it doesn't take long before you start losing your best people. They'll move on. They don't, they don't want to be treated like just a cog in the wheel of your organization. Uh, they've got to be valued. They've got to be made better because they work with you. I, I learned that early on when I was the president of a seminary. It was kind of before the electronic age where you send a lot of electronic kind of memos or even emails. And so I typically would put out a paper memo to all the staff and... My assistant would put it in everybody's... Was that on stone tablet? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It took a while to chisel that out. But um, <laughs> you, but a memo would go out, and I'm a very cognitive type person, so I would just give them the facts, you know? Just here, here's, the, here's the facts. This is going to be changed. This is going to be how it will be in the future, and so on. And that was fine for all the cognitive-oriented people. They, they wanted it succinct, just give me the facts. But all my feelers uh, that work for me... I'd find them in tears. I'd find them with hurt feelings. Like it just seemed so cold, so callous that I was just changing things so abruptly, so brazenly and, and not even being sensitive to their feelings. And I, it, it used to just drive me crazy until I realized, well, you know, when you just put out a memo, it's, it's not like you're just changing a software program. You know, it's not like yeah. you're just changing the settings and your preferences. You're working with people. And to have a really healthy, vibrant organization, you've got to be people sensitive. And at the end of the day, you, you know, you, you may have increased profits for your company, but if you've lost half of your people because they're so offended and hurt and feel so used uh, for the way you treated them while you were increasing profits, it, it won't take long before you're not making big profits anymore because all your best people will have moved to your competitor uh, where they're treated better. And so I, I always, I think it's important to, to recognize, I remember, I remember one time a, a young church planter who was really excited about planting a church, and, and there were some people that were intrigued by his vision, and I'll tell you what, he could go into your office and tell you this great vision of what their church was going to be like, and he could tell you their core values, and, and he could tell you all kinds of things about the demographics of the community where he's going to build his church. But uh, within six months, he had nobody left uh, with around him. And the fact is, he didn't know how to work with people. And, and the people who had signed up to work with him very quickly became disillusioned and realized he didn't care about them. They, he just needed people to, to make his dream come true, hmm. uh, to, uh, to help him achieve his vision. But he didn't actually care about them. This guy, before long, it didn't matter what his vision was, that nobody wanted to sign up to, to go after it with him. So you have to remember that ultimately what you are is you're, when you lead, you're not leading uh, an organizational chart. You're leading people. It reminds me of, a, uh, I believe it's a quote in, in your book that, that someone said that, you know, leadership is easy, would be easy if it weren't for all the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why, the, and sometimes people say, well, is leadership an art? Uh, because 
it, it's hard to just have a formula for people. You know, you yeah. So it'll your leadership will work fine with certain kinds of people, and then others will be in tears. And you'll you'll the first thought is, well, I need to get rid of all the people that don't respond to me. Uh, in my leadership, and then you realize, well, no, leadership involves a lot more finesse, a lot more nuance than just doing the same thing, just firing off a memo. You've got to become very skilled at understanding people and what motivates them, what inspires them. And that's really the key to great leadership is learning how to connect with the people under your care so that you get the most out of them. And and you bless them because they are working with you. Well, one one final observation I want to make as we kind of dissect your definition of, of spiritual leadership, and and you mention at the very end God's agenda, and yeah. that and that seems to differentiate your your definition from from others. Why did you put that in your definition? You know, I, I think uh, that's probably one of the most defining aspects of the book we wrote. When, when people tell me the chapters that impacted their life and their leadership the most, our discussion in chapter four of uh, God's agenda is what they'll say was worth the price of the book. And, um, and that is because every leader operates on an agenda. Mm-hmm. You, you're just fooling yourself if you don't think you have an agenda. The question is just simply, where did your agenda come from? Adolf Hitler had his own agenda. Uh, he drove people onto what he wanted them to do. He he drove them to where he wanted them to go. Uh, and so sometimes our agenda just comes from our own selfish, evil intentions. Some leaders are very insecure, and they basically lead in such a way that they build themselves up. They build a monument to themselves and their ego need. I know pastors like that that are very insecure. And so the way to address their insecurity is to grow a big church and surround themselves with increasing numbers of people that love them and think they're wonderful. Mm. And yet, no matter how many thousands of people are surrounding them, they still, if they are being driven by insecurity, oftentimes you can't get enough thousands of people around you to take away that feeling of insecurity. You may be driven by just trying to please people. You may be driven by trying to somehow make your father proud of you. Your father never blessed you and told you you're doing a good job. And so you've been driven for the last 30 years to try to prove to your dad that you weren't a loser. Yeah. I, I mean, I see so many different ways where, although the people might not even recognize what's driving them, they haven't. Sometimes they're, they're driv- their agenda is just plain greed. They just... They want to grow uh, their church so that they can get paid a bigger salary or they can increase profits and sales so they can make more money. They're just that they, they can compete with the, their three brothers who are also in business and they want to be a better businessman and compete with their friends or their college roommate or whoever else. Uh, lots and lots of agendas. But uh, for a spiritual leader, you're driven by God's agenda. That happens even in a secular business setting. I uh, regularly minister to Christian CEOs of very large companies, Fortune 500 companies. But what they're learning is God has an agenda even for their secular company. Uh, Of course, they're going to try to make profits. They're going to increase sales. Uh, But God also wants them to be a blessing to their employees. Uh, God wants them to leverage the influence they have in business to build his kingdom. And so these guys, I don't need to teach them how to increase sales. They know they're much better at that than I am. But what they're saying is, but I don't know how to know what God's agenda is Mm. uh, for my family. You know, of course, when you're leading kids, we can be driven by our own agenda and say, well, I want my kids to all go to the university that I graduated from, or I want them all to live uh, close to home. You know, I want them to go into the same line of work that I'm in. And I, I see lots of parents who put all kinds of pressure on their adult children uh, to end up being the kind of adults that they want them to be. But you don't have a sense that it's God's agenda. You don't have a sense that they prayed and said, God, what is it you have for this child of mine? And how can I be a part of that agenda? Uh, and so we'll unpack that in a uh, later podcast. But of course, it really begs the question, if you're going to move people onto God's agenda, you have to know what God's yeah. agenda what is. is. Yeah. What is God's and agenda? <laughs> you have to, and when God tries to tell you what his agenda is, you've got to be able to recognize his voice and his leading. 
Uh, otherwise, it doesn't matter what God wants to do with your kids or your business or your church because he can't communicate it with you so that you know. Uh, you, and so to, to be driven by God's agenda, you've got to be walking with him in such a way that you know what it is. That's what I love about this definition. It can be so easily applied to mm-hmm. any area of life. It, it, yeah. it isn't just pigeonholed into to one aspect of leadership or one area of leadership. This can be taken and, as you've said, applied applied anywhere. And, you know, the, the other thing, too, with that is that leadership, if, if uh, not used uh, wisely, is just a, a, a skilled means of manipulation. Hmm. A lot of people study leadership simply as a way to manipulate their people to do what they want them to do. Uh, they, they'll say, well, I'm, I know business people who read leadership books all the time because they want to get more maximum results out of their employees so that it increases the bottom line. And I would say, well, be careful with that because if leadership is simply a tool for you to manipulate a business and people to get what you want, then uh, that's, that's really for evil purposes. Uh, but if you're driven by God's agenda... God is always going to work through you in a way that blesses people, that uh, helps people become more like Christ, that extends his kingdom. Christ is not going to drive you to be selfish. Christ will not drive you to manipulate and, and use people. He'll, he'll use you to bless people. And that's why I think it's so important. Because even well-intentioned people, even pastors have been driven this way, where they'll use people in order to grow their church. And they think it's for a good purpose. They're doing it for God. But there's a trail of broken, used, disillusioned people uh, in their wake who are saying, he, he didn't care about me. He just used me so that he could increase his church size and attendance. And when I wasn't useful to the pastor anymore, he just discarded me and found someone else he could use. And so I, I think you have to just be driven by God's agenda because God will always use you to bless people. When, when God is the one working through your life, people will be grateful that uh, they they were connected to you, that you led them. And, uh, I, and, and if you're leading on God's agenda, people will always be made better people because of how you led. Well, again, the, the definition that, that we're going to be working with, moving people onto God's agenda. I just think that's a, a, a beautifully succinct way. Thank you. To, <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, to, to just illustrate uh, how anyone can be a leader no matter where they yeah. are. Really looking forward to unpacking this in future shows. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you again, Richard, for, for giving of your time to, to talk with us on this very important subject. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, review us on Apple Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. If you have questions or comments, please email us at podcast at blackbee.org.